All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, this is our first of this uh, quarter's Breakfast with Watch series, or second, I guess. We have one a couple weeks ago. Um, and so if you don't know about those, uh, we try to do these um, about once a month or so on not any kind of a regular schedule, but um, try to focus on topics around uh, relevant to the Health of Women, Adolescents, and Children. And today we have Drs. Christina Adams Waldorf and uh, Rada Mirza, who are going to be talking to us about um, Zika virus. And they both have been conducting exciting new research on Zika virus, both from the uh, standpoint of, of uh, impact on showing models of Zika virus infection in non human primates and looking at um, the evidence uh, around the, the level of um, damage to uh, infant brains uh, associated with the virus. So I'll let them take over from there. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you, first of all. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for having me here. And it's a real pleasure to, to uh, give this talk with Rada Mirza, so I'm excited to hear what she has to say. But um, I want to give you a little bit of perspective on this epidemic as well as a perspective on what it's like to research Zika um, in this current scientific climate. And what happened to our team back in January when we first started reading the newspaper reports about Zika and uh, how this went. Um, I think of Zika really as the uh, perfect storm and an unprecedented health threat for pregnant women. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the CDC director, Dr. Tom Frieden. But before I get into the talk, I need you all to go to your happy place, wherever that is, because what we're going to show you today and what we're going to talk about is significantly depressing. And when you feel it in the pit of your stomach and you feel slightly ill, then I know that you have understood how bad this is, not only for the more than 2 million pregnancies around the world that are currently at risk, but those pregnancies that have already been affected and those children that have been born. So let's backtrack a little bit. What is the Zika virus? Where does it come from? It was first isolated in 1947 in a rhesus monkey in the Zika forest in Uganda, where it gets its name. Transmitted by the bite of an 80s Egypti mosquito, that's the yellow fever mosquito, that story is a bit more complicated, and I think I'll have time to tell you a bit more about that. It's something called, it's from a family of viruses called a flavivirus. So it's related to dengue virus, yellow fever, chikungunya, Japanese encephalitis, hepatitis C. And uh, there are some unique properties about this class of viruses that create issues surrounding vaccine development and complicate our response to the epidemic. Uh, the Zika virus has been isolated from humans all around the globe and will track its progression, Africa, Southeast Asia, Oceania, and now the Americas, and now even Florida. And prior to 2007, there were only 14 cases of Zika documented in humans. And when this first started in January, we went to PubMed and we printed out all 50 publications about Zika and we put them into a little binder and we felt incredibly good about ourselves that we knew everything that there was to know about Zika. These days, there are between 40 and 60 manuscripts relevant to our research that are published every single week. So Saturday, I get in my email inbox, pub crawler, I look through all those manuscripts, and I ask myself, are we still on the cutting edge? Is what we're doing still relevant? Has someone published before us? What's happening? Does anything here uh, impact the scientific direction of our work? Um, it's something like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. Um, every single day is a new day where you can be scooped or where you might lose all of your innovation. Um, so it's uh, literally working around the clock and racing for a good purpose and for a good reason, but it's at a different pace for scientific research than I have been working in the past, and I thought that I was working hard at that time. So the global spread of Zika, let's start um, at number one, and that's 1947 in Uganda where it was first isolated. The number of reports um, in the 1960s um, from Nigeria. And then in the 1970s, it shows up in Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia. And then super interesting, in 2007, it shows up on Yap Island in Micronesia. And I think that I 
remove that slide, but physicians on Yap Island were incredibly astute to recognize possibly a new infection, seeing something that didn't look as bad as dengue, a little bit different than chikungunya. They called the CDC and they found Zika, which had swept the island with uh, three quarters of people ha being IgM positive at that time. We learned a lot about the virus from that, from that discovery. Then in 2013, it came to French Polynesia. And then in 2014 to 16, appears in northern Brazil. And we think that it came there through either one of two sporting events. There was a world canoeing event that brought a lot of Polynesians to Brazil, followed very quickly by uh, the World Cup. And in one of those cases, an ill traveler with Zika from probably Polynesia, but hard to say, maybe Oceania, got on a plane, got off the plane in Brazil, got bitten by a mosquito, and that was it. It had jumped then to South America. So in January, I was actually taking some leave from work, starting to look at a, a, for another reason, and I was looking through a newspaper and saw this link but in, you know, with microcephaly and uh, possibly the Zika virus epidemic and immediately got a pit in my stomach um, that I can't even begin to describe and I'll show you why on the next slide. Brazil didn't have a standard process to report microcephaly. In fact, most countries don't, but they thought they maybe had 150 in the prior year, um, which is probably an underestimate. Suddenly they had 4,200 cases that they couldn't explain and that happened exactly in tandem with the Zika outbreak. The Zika virus had been isolated from amniotic fluid and placenta. And prior to the Zika outbreak, you know, reporting of microcephaly in Brazil is not mandatory. In fact, understanding neonatal and maternal outcomes is not a major priority in many parts of the world. And I think that this group here understands that better than, uh, better than anyone. And if you don't know what's going on with your maternal and neonatal outcomes, Something like this can happen. Um, a big e epidemic can happen right under your very nose without you knowing what happened, what has happened for many, many months. The next thing that kind of really took us uh, hard was uh, the first case report about Zika in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a woman who lived in Slovenia who came, went to Brazil as kind of an aid worker and she had been had an early pregnancy at the time. She developed a fever at the end of her first trimester and then ended up moving back to Slovenia. Got an ultrasound in Slovenia at 14 and 20 weeks that were normal, and we can talk about why that might have been. But then at 29 to 32 weeks, something very terrible happened. And as an obstetrician, I'm guessing that the growth of her uterus did not match what it was supposed to match based on fundal height, a measurement that we do throughout pregnancy to make sure the pregnancy is growing appropriately, they got an ultrasound. And at that point, the brain was incredibly small, less than the second percentile. Fluid in the brain and the brain structures looked blurred. That's not a term that we really use in obstetrics because that just doesn't happen um, unless we're talking about a very, very severe case of cytomegalovirus and they discovered Zika virus genome in the fetal brain. So with that, I'm going to leave you there for a moment and hand it over to Reda, Mirza, and uh, then I'll come back at the end. So thanks a lot, uh, Christina. So, and thank you for organizing this, this talk. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here and talk to you about what we know about congenital Zika infection. I'm a pediatrician and a geneticist, and I've been studying brain uh, uh, disorders in children, specifically cortical malformations and microcephaly in children for many, many years. And I'd like to think that I've seen really severe uh, brain malformations and that we, you know, and we study these brain malformations in the hopes of understanding their underlying causes. And so we've seen a lot of abnormal, you know, pathology uh, in kids, but certainly the congenital Zika infection has shed a new light on a whole spectrum of disorders that unfortunately is, as Christina mentioned, quite, quite severe in children. So I'd like to highlight this spectrum for you here. Again, as a geneticist, from a diagnostic perspective, this is unfortunately, we're often on the, you know, the bad end of the time frame. It's after a child has been born with a presumably neurologic disorder uh, that we see these kids. Um, and, and so, and, and truly, I think the most exciting research, honestly, I'll say is Christina's and not mine. I'm, I'm, most of my work has been simply on the descriptive end to understand the spectrum of abnormalities that occurs in, in these children. 
And before I go on, um, part of my talk, I'll show you some of our, one of our studies, which is a series of about 57 children with a presumed congenital Zika infection that we had studied and looked at their brain MRI scans and CT imaging. And really, I'll say that these children are actually the children of Brazilian collaborators who not only evaluated these kids and uh, collected their data, but continue to take care of these kids. And without the collaboration of our Brazilian collaborators, really, we wouldn't be able to do any of these uh, studies. And I'll also say that a lot of the uh, organization of this amount of data that I'll, I will show you some of uh, this talk was actually by my senior colleague, uh, Bill Dobbins, uh, who's a geneticist at Seattle Children's as well, who contributed several of my slides. So to kind of highlight the time frame that uh, Christina had already mentioned so well is that you know, just very briefly, again, in early March of 2015, uh, the reports of Zika viral infection began to emerge uh, in Brazil specifically. Um, in September of 2015, so a few months later, there was, as Christina mentioned, an increased rate of microcephaly being reported, and there is a, a, a very important under-ascertainment, potentially, of microcephaly prior to uh, this time frame, um, because, again, uh, as uh, Christina just said, the uh, head, head uh, growth measurements were not routinely recorded, and microcephaly was not routinely reported uh, as well. Um, so there is probably an under-ascertainment. But, but there was basically a jump, with, with the estimates being from 0.6 prior to 2015 up to 2.8 for 10,000 live births, and this was obtained from birth certificate uh, data. And then uh, Zika virus RNA was isolated from two separate women uh, who, whose fetuses had microcephaly. Around that time, the Brazilian Ministry of Health established a task force to investigate a possible association of microcephaly with Zika virus. And a few months later, in April of 2016, uh, the World Health Organization and CDC acknowledged that there is a causal association between Zika and microcephaly. And by, up to, uh, by June 2016, so up until a few months ago, approximately 7,830 suspected cases were reported to the Brazilian Ministry of Health, which is a staggeringly high number. And I'll show you some of the, more, the largest series that I know of uh, in the very last part of my talk, showing how many of those actually were confirmed to be uh, due to Zika infection. Certainly not all of these uh, were. Um, but again, this is quite frightening. Um, so. As a, as a geneticist, uh, this was, the Zika epidemic was certainly remarkable for several reasons. First of all, this is the first epidemic of a viral infection that's associated with severe birth defects. And more importantly, it was clearly apparent, even from the very earliest stories of Zika that began to appear, is that this virus has a, is particularly devastating. Infection with this virus is particularly devastating to the developing fetal brain. Um, it was quite concerning to us uh, as geneticists who study uh, brain malformations that a lot of the media reports early on was Zika is a causative of microcephaly and, and even more, which was somewhat inaccurate and an under uh, uh, description. And what was even more erroneous was that uh, it was reported to be cause of primary microcephaly, which is quite erroneous actually. And I'll explain to you why and what primary microcephaly in uh, pediatric uh, terms and genetic terms uh, means. I mean, a cursory even just view of these children and even just looking at some of the stories that began to emerge early on, uh, most people would be, would, were able to tell that these kids not, didn't just have microcephaly. They had a lot more severe abnormalities. And I'll show you some examples of that from uh, imaging as well. And now we know that Zika infection is really constitutes a recognizable pattern of disruption and malformation and strongly supports the diagnosis of congenital Zika syndrome. And keep in mind that we're, the full clinical spectrum is yet to be determined, right? So we're seeing, as with everything, as with most d pediatric disorders, we see the tip of the iceberg first, and then we appreciate the full spectrum. So the, our knowledge is undoubtedly gonna, gonna expand. So briefly, what I'm gonna outline to you is what is the definition of microcephaly? To put us all on, that, on the same page, because I think this is really important, in analyzing the stories and discerning the stories that are related to Zika that come out in the literature and in the uh, media, what are the clinical features of Zika, congenital Zika infection? And briefly, maternal factors associated with Zika infection, at least from some of our studies. And I only touch base briefly about the mechanism, but I'll leave really the bulk of that to Christina, who's done really very exciting research in this area. So microcephaly simply means a head size that is less than two standard deviations below the mean for age and gender shown over here. This has been the standard textbook definition of microcephaly. Um, in clinical practice, uh, many normal, developmentally normal children are at the edge here. And so, so clinically relevant or clinically significant microcephaly, it's considered to be three standard deviations or more below the mean for age and gender and ethnicity. 
So really, really, we see a spectrum of kids with microcephaly. And importantly, when reporting on it, it's very important to be objective by documenting not only the head size, but the gestational age, and how many standard deviations below the mean the head size falls. Um, and microcephaly in and of itself is not a condition. It's a neurologic sign. It's a feature, but not a syndrome in and of itself. I'll, and I'll highlight to you some of the genetic causes very briefly, or some of the causes briefly. So it's important to remember that in a lot of the reporting that came out, certainly from Brazil, which was the, where the, the majority of the uh, reports have occurred, the definition of microcephaly evolved. And this table from a, very, uh, a recent paper actually shows what, how the definition of microcephaly uh, changed across the past two, uh, for the past two years. So earlier on in 2015, the Brazilian Ministry of Health uh, used a hard cutoff for microcephaly. First, it was 33 centimeters for both sexes, and then it was 32 centimeters for both sexes. But this was not highly accurate, of course, because uh, boys, on average, have a larger head size than girls. So early in March 2016, the definition was modified to be more in accordance with the World Health Organization definition, which is two standard deviations below the mean for age and gender. And this was, in, in uh, absolute terms, was 31.5 centimeters for girls and 31.9 uh, uh, centimeters for boys. And it's important to keep in mind that in a lot of the early microcephaly papers, the presence of microcephaly was considered to be an inclusion criteria. And so therefore, children without microcephaly were excluded for some of these earlier reports. So there's a bias in the reporting as well. This has now improved dramatically with more recent uh, series with an improved laboratory evidence of Zika in a lot of the reported cases. But this is important to keep in mind is that there is, again, this ascertainment bias that has occurred. Um, and in our study that I'll show you, we used the World Health Organization uh, definition of microcephaly. This is a, a very general slide w w that I, I just want to show you through, through this, the, the broad category of causes that we, I won't go into that cause microcephaly. But it's important at all times, again, when we're evaluating these children or uh, analyzing these stories to take a step back and understand that microcephaly, again, can be caused by a wide variety of causes, some of which are genetic and some of which are acquired. And certainly among the acquired causes, congenital viral infections uh, several viral infections are associated with microcephaly, the most famous of which is cytomegalovirus, or CMV. And in fact, I think I was just mentioning to Christina that at Seattle Children's, we had a Zika scare, as they say, um, with a child who had multiple abnormalities, um, and, um, uh, but later was found to have a CMV. So CMV is still a very common cause of microcephaly that resembles Zika infection in children. Um, but again, there's a wide variety of causes, and, uh, and many of these are associated with uh, abnormalities of several other systems not just microcephaly. Highlighting again, and I'll emphasize this point again and again, is that microcephaly is just a feature. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a condition in and of itself. So here's actually what primary microcephaly is, because again, several of the earlier very high profile media stories that came out were, were, were using the term primary microcephaly, which was completely in error. So primary microcephaly is a term that was used early on in the pediatric literature and the genetic literature to refer to congenital onset, so early onset microcephaly that is noted at birth or shortly after birth, usually the structure of the brain is otherwise normal. So here's actually an MRI scan of a normal child showing you this is a mid-sagittal view and an axial view, showing the, what the normal gyral pattern looks like of the cerebral cortex, which is a very highly folded uh, 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 structure. And this is actually the same, these are the same views of a child whose age matched with primary microcephaly. And you'll notice that the head size is smaller, of course, but if, and if you look at the, the cortex, the, the, there's, there is also the same gyral pattern with nice folding of the brain. So the brain is smaller, but it's structurally normal. Typically, what the only thing we see is in the most common forms is just a simplification of this folding pattern. But this happens whenever the head size is smaller, of course, there will be that simplification. But again, otherwise, the structure of the brain is, is normal. It is highly folded. A lot of these kids have mild to moderate cognitive and developmental delays. Okay? So this is the term primary microcephaly. And again, it used to denote it. It's, it was used uh, as a contrast to secondary microcephaly, in which microcephaly is part of a multi-system disorder where there are a lot of brain abnormalities and non-brain abnormalities. So primary microcephaly meant isolated microcephaly. So you can see already, and I'll sh uh, once you see the images of, of uh, brain images of children with Zika virus, you'll immediately then tell that this term is erroneously used with Zika infection because Here's what a, a brain MRI of a child with Zika infection looks like. The head size is small, but then if you look closely, you'll see several abnormalities. This brain is clearly not like this brain. The surface of the cortex, uh, the surface of the brain is markedly abnormal. 
the brain volume is markedly smaller. You'll see increased space right around the brain and increased space actually within the ventricles themselves right, shown right here. And I'm sorry about the resolution, by the way. But, and again, and again the, the folding structure of the uh, uh, brain is markedly disrupted. And I'll show you uh, better images as we go along. You'll also see these signal intensities here, which are calcifications. So this brain completely does not look like this brain. So it's very false to say that children with Zika, uh, congenital Zika infection, have primary microcephaly uh, mostly. So what do uh, the brain MRIs, what, do, uh, what does the brain look like in children with a Zika infection? So first I'll show you some CT abnormal uh, abnormalities. Certainly CT is uh, uh, most widely available in various regions and providences in Brazil. And, and uh, MRIs are not available in all of the, uh, the regions. So a lot of the reports have been mostly relying on CT abnormalities and ultrasound abnormalities to some extent, um, and now increasingly MRI. But the CT uh, uh, imaging by itself really shows striking abnormalities uh, that can be high highly diagnostic. The most important feature are calcifications. So uh, uh, widespread calcifications are very common in the severe end of the Zika syndrome. And these calcifications you can clearly appreciate here by the signal intensities that are shown here. The location, so I'm sorry, the distribution can be is uh, quite extensive. It can be more focal or segmental in, in some situations. But you can see here the examples that I have shown you, are, I'm showing you here, are probably the most severe in a way, and they're uh, really extensive. The location of these uh, calcifications are variable. Many of them are subcortical, but certainly uh, they are white, they're widespread in their distribution. Some of them are periventricular. Uh, they also involve the basal ganglia and the brainstem. So this is in contrast to congenital cytomegalovirus infection, in which calcifications are typically periventricular. In Zika infection, on the other hand, they are most often subcortical, but can involve the periventricular regions, brainstem, and basal ganglia, so much more extensive distribution. In this child over here, actually, what you'd appreciate is that the, the cerebral volume is markedly reduced. Most of this brain is fluid, unfortunately. So it's really hard to determine whether these calcifications that are present here are actually periventricular or subcortical, and perhaps, on a, sadly, it doesn't make a difference for this child. Um, so these are the most classic abnormalities on CT uh, imaging. Um, for, for these children. And you'll appreciate as well is that there is a decreased uh, brain volume. In this child, actually, the uh, cerebellum is markedly abnormal as well. So this is the uh, location of the cerebellum right here, and you'll appreciate increased fluid and an abnormality and calcifications as well. So what do the brain MRIs look like for kids with congenital Zika infection? Brain MRIs even give you a broader and better uh, and more accurate picture of what the structure of the brain looks like, and this is really important. So first, the brain, of course, is obviously small. The surface of the cortex, as I mentioned to you, is markedly abnormal. So the cortex, if we went on a close look, it has an increased number and a very small uh, size of the normal folds that we see in a typical brain, what we call microgyri. And microgyri in neuroimaging uh, uh, literature is, uh, fits very well with a cortical malformation called polymicrogyria, which has been known and well described in the literature for decades to be due mostly to a disruptive injury to the brain. There have been some reports uh, that emerged suggesting that there are neuro neuronal migration defects uh, and diagnosing things like lysencephaly, which means a smooth brain. Um, we don't think that these are actually accurate because what happens is that when the resolution of the MRI is really poor, you, and when, you, when the uh, brain volume is so reduced, when you look at this brain, you'll think, yeah, it is absolutely smooth. But actually, on closer look to the surface of the cortex, you see how there is thicker intensity, higher intensity uh, signal over here. This is what microgyria looks like, and it typically uh, reflects PMG and a disruption or injury to the developing brain. You can also appreciate that the ventricles are markedly enlarged, and there's increased extraaxial space as well. White matter volume is markedly decreased. So this is quite a severe neurologic disorder. And the severity of the brain MRI abnormalities is quite staggering. It's certainly among the most severe we have seen in our experience uh, um, evaluating kids with brain malformations. It's so severe, in fact, that it resembles something that has also been clinically described in the literature prior to the Zika epidemic called fetal brain disruption sequence. Fetal brain disruption sequence is something, again, that there has been a lot of clinical literature published on this. And kids with Zika infections certainly resemble that. What it really uh, uh, looks like is when a child is born, if you look at these two pictures, you can see the severity of microcephaly. I mean, these children virtually have almost no skull prominence, which is quite severe. What happens actually, and uh, on this picture actually here, it shows you a very, very, again, it's a very severe picture, um, but it shows you that there's overlapping, there's a complete collapse in a way. 
and there's overlapping, there are these, uh, this redundant skin and this, this prominence, bony prominence over here. So what we believe happens is that unfortunately, because of this very severe insult to the developing brain, there is a collapse that happens within the skull. And as a result, the frontal, parietal, and temporal bones collapse over the occipital bone over here. And it causes what's been described as the occipital shelf. Um, and again, and when, when you look at the uh, imaging, you can clearly tell again that brain volume is markedly affected. And so this, this really resembles to us what has called, been called fetal brain disruption um, in, in kids. Uh, and uh, and th this actually is a nice uh, 3D image here showing you exactly that occipital shelf. And you'll appreciate the, uh, the uh, collapse of the other uh, uh, bones on top of the occipital bone with overlapping sutures. So it's not that the skull does not develop. It's not that it's small in size. There's not premature fusion, actually, of the, uh, the sutures, which, jumped, which will cause microcephaly. The most common form of microcephaly is actually premature fusion of the sutures. But it's actually uh, 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 collapse and overlapping of uh, the bones, skull bones. So in a subset of kids, there are severe tone abnormalities as well. When you take a step back from uh, uh, and, and take a look at these kids, I mean, approximately half of reported kids, I would say roughly, that have been reported, a lot of these kids have tone abnormalities. And you wouldn't see these tone abnormalities again in primary microcephaly. Most of the time, those kids have just mild hypotonia, but they're otherwise OK. But in a, in a significant fraction of kids with congenital Zika infection, they have really severe contractures affecting the large uh, proximal joints, as shown over here, or arthro, what, what, what we call arthrogryposis. Uh, a smaller fraction of kids also have ophthalmologic abnormalities, chorioretinal atrophy, abnormal uh, 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 macular pigmentation, optic nerve hypoplasia, small eyes or macrophthalmia, and these resemble in a way some of the ophthalmologic abnormalities this, that we see with congenital uh, CMV infection, but this affects a, a fraction of kids. So this is just a, these are a few summary slides that I'm going to show you now, just from our series that we have ascertained with our uh, uh, Brazilian collaborators, showing that we had approximately 57 kids uh, who we reviewed uh, their imaging on, and most of them had severe microcephaly, more than three standard deviations below the mean. Uh, most of them had spasticity or tone abnormalities. Severe irritability and tremor affected a significant fraction of these kids, and a smaller fraction had arthrogryposis and uh, uh, seizures. In terms of the brain MRI abnormalities, the most consistent features across our series, and uh, we believe that the literature reflects that as well, um, are the calcifications, white matter volume loss, enlargement of the ventricles, and an abnorm abnormalities of the cerebral cortex. And this is actually consistent with what's also been published and acknowledged by the uh, Brazilian Ministry of Health as diagnostic guidelines, imaging diagnostic guidelines for congenital Zika infection. And they very nicely outlined it here, actually, based on ultrasound findings during pregnancy, uh, ultrasound findings postnatally, and then CT and MRI findings. And uh, if you go through them, it's essentially the same key features that I've just highlighted. So to summarize, congenital Zika infection is a congenital microcephaly disorder that's characterized by a recognizable combination of malformations in its severe form uh, that are characterized by cortical abnormalities, white matter volume loss, uh, and uh, diffuse calcifications. And these are some of the less common findings that I've just highlighted to you in a second. Um, I will actually, just in the essence of time, because I don't want to take some of Christina's time, I'll just actually highlight um, my last few slides, which is, this is actually uh, a very large, it's the largest series to date that I know of, of uh, children with uh, uh, Zika infection. So this, is, this was published in a, uh, June 2016 that I would uh, refer you to, which actually really uh, uh, did a very thorough examination of all of the suspected cases of Zika, uh, uh, or presumed Zika infection that were reported to the Brazilian Ministry of Health. There were approximately 5,900 5, suspected cases reported from November to February of 2016, so that's not even accounting for the past few months. Uh, only uh, 1,600 had complete investigations, um, and of those, 15, about 1,500 were live-born infants, and they actually uh, then performed a thorough review of these uh, uh, 1,500 children. They stratified them based on two important criteria laboratory evidence of Zika infection and neuroimaging abnormalities. They stratified them into five groups. So 76 of the 1,500 had definite evidence of Zika, which was defined by laboratory evidence of congenital Zika infection, either by serology or PCR. And there are limitations in interpreting all of these laboratory results, of course, which is beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about. 54 of these had probable Zika infection defined as highly characteristic imaging abnormalities, but negative lab results 
for other infections that mimic Zika clinically, including syphilis, toxoplasmosis, and CMV. And then uh, a large fraction had moderately probable, which meant that they had imaging findings highly suggestive of Zika, but there were no lab results, whether ruling in or ruling out uh, Zika. And then uh, a, a large number as well had somewhat probable, which meant that they had imaging findings uh, that were descriptively reported without actually accurate imaging data, perhaps, and uh, lab results for other infections that mimic Zika, either unavailable or negative. And then the majority of cases actually did not meet any of these two criteria. No laboratory evidence and no imaging criteria, so they fell short, and so they did not actually uh, uh, fit. Now, this actually causes a bias, as a reminder again, in our ability to understand the full Zika-related spectrum, because the laboratory testing still has its limitations. And again, if we, we're only ascertaining right now the tip of the iceberg from a clinical perspective. So we don't know how many kids are born with uh, Zika pregnancies are born actually who have borderline uh, uh, mild involvement or mild involvement. Um, I will only highlight from this large series, one of their interesting observations is that the, the, the clinical growth measurements uh, differences between um, these groups was small. Um, and overall, the discarded cases that did not meet their uh, uh, criteria overall had a larger head size and uh, lower first week mortality and less history of rash during pregnancy. So that's helpful in a way, especially given this large series. The, um, they also concluded that rashes in the third trimester of pregnancy associated with brain abnormalities uh, were associated with brain abnormalities despite a normal OFC. And we need to take these results, I think, with a little bit of grain of salt. This is interesting, actually. But, and again, it highlights that there's a full clinical spectrum, which is that one in five definite or probable cases presented with OFCs in the normal range. When, because they only asked, their imaging criteria was based on striking abnormalities, not specifically microcephaly. They ascertained actually a number of children who had a normal head size that had either definite evidence of Zika or probable, highly probable evidence of Zika infection. So that's important. So it's not just, again, emphasizing, it's not just microcephaly. Um, I will skip this, actually. And finally, this is my last slide, which is just to show you, so how does you know, Zika affect the developing brain? Uh, as Christina mentioned, it's actually very hard to keep track of this literature at this point because there's just such a massive blurry. And a lot of these are really high impact, very important basic sciences research, and the speed of it. And I, again, commend Christina and her team on the speed with which they were able to complete this phenomenal project. The speed is quite remarkable, actually. Some of the presumed hypotheses, and that I'll just briefly mention, and I'll leave the rest. Uh, I'll leave the rest. Is that Zika virus is have a, has a specific affinity to neural progenitor stem cells. So these are the uh, stem cell pool that generates all of the adult neurons and supporting cells or glia in the in in the brain. And some of the studies have actually proposed that there are two possible mechanisms that it, it's specifically neurotrophic to uh, neuroprogenitor stem uh, stem cells. And some of the mechanisms have proposed that maybe it binds to a specific receptor that's present in uh, uh, neuroprogenitor stem cells called called the axle uh, family of receptors. Um, and therefore that the, the developing uh, neuroprogenitor stem cells are specifically vulnerable to Zika infection. There have been uh, a lot of interesting studies actually that have emerged over the past few weeks uh, saying that adult neurons are actually also susceptible to Zika infection and therefore that there might be adult related consequences not to scare anybody but you know but and these are still few studies we're keeping track or trying to keep track of the literature and that's really really uh, uh, interesting and we'll see hopefully how, how much more we'll, uh, we'll learn. I'm sure it'll be a lot. So with that, I'm sorry if I went over time, Christina. I will uh, give it back to you. This is just a summary slide that highlights the same points that I've mentioned to you, by the way, which is that it's a full spectrum um, uh, and a very broad spectrum. And we're seeing the tip of the iceberg um, at this point in time. So thanks very much for your attention, by the way. Thank you so much, Rita. So uh, my perspective on this um, is really that of an obstetrician. And as an obstetrician, I think all obstetricians, we've all delivered babies that have uh, very, very severe birth defects. Uh, usually they're genetic. And even when those defects are expected, uh, I think all of us know the intense grief um, in the delivery room, uh, which is something that just never really leaves you. And uh, as an obstetrician, my, you know, my absolute joy is delivering beautiful, healthy babies to a family that, that desires that baby more than anything. And to know that these babies really were so normal at one point, and then with Zika infection had this terrible thing happen in their brain to the point of skull collapse in certain cases, many of this being unrecognized in a part of the world that doesn't have the resources to support taking care of these infants afterwards um, is is the part is the perfect storm for me. 
that this entire population was naive to Zika, that it came and took South America, Central America, the Caribbean kind of by storm, puts all of those pregnancies at risk. So one of the questions that I've gotten from my patients um, that either have a partner that wants to travel or they themselves want to travel is, what is the risk that my pregnancy, uh, that I might get a microcephaly or some sort of brain defect from Zika um, with infection? Is it 100%? Well, it's probably not 100%, uh, but it's somewhere on that spectrum. So Polynesia, with their you know um, stellar uh, understanding of maternal and child health, said that they had eight cases of microcephaly per 270,000 pregnancies at the time of, of Zika infection there. No way is that even close. They said they had a two-thirds infection rate, and so maybe there was a 1% risk of this type of birth defect when, they, when Zika uh, was present in their area. Brazil had a completely different problem because when the hysteria came about microcephaly, they had a lot of over-reporting and this kind of shift in, in diagnostic criteria and they came up with, in all their brilliance, between a 1% and 13% risk. None of this reflects the tail of brain injury that doesn't really come with microcephaly. I don't know that we're that much closer to understanding what that risk really is, and some of our research will reflect that. But epidemiologically, there's a big problem with clinical confirmation of cases that Rada pointed out, under-reporting, over-reporting, and now we're hearing stories of evidence of fetal brain injury with infection in second and third trimesters, there is no time in pregnancy that is safe. And what happens is, is that child has a normal brain size or you know, somewhat normal at birth, but then it never grows again. And so they end up having a diagnosis of microcephaly at six months, and this is starting to be labeled as late onset microcephaly. So this is a problem that you're only going to really appreciate the true impact of over time. It's not just the babies being born right now and what they look like at birth, but it's the ones with brains that just don't grow normally, that don't meet their milestones. It's, um, you know, it's just like a case study of, um, you know, an absolutely devastating public health problem that comes to a part of the world. I just was wondering, do you think immunity has anything to do with... Yes. Do we know anything about that? That these populations were naive to Zika is the problem. So now that a large portion of the population is becoming immune, those women that have become immune, their next pregnancies are probably going to be okay. Would that explain the low, the potentially low, lower risk of microcephaly and Polynesia, do you think, or do you think it's just underreported? You know, they were naive at one point, too, and then this came. There's also differences in viral strains as we go along, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So what was discovered in 1947 in Africa is, is nothing like what we have currently in Brazil, although the contemporary Asian strains are probably pretty similar in their pathogenic potential. So uh, the answer is we don't know. It's a complete hot mess uh, throughout much of the world. So as an obstetrician, I've studied um, infection-related fetal injury uh, for nearly 15 years. And so the things that I think about that might impact whether or not a pregnancy might be susceptible to Zika fetal injury is dose. How many mosquito bites did that woman receive? Uh, what was the inoculum per mosquito bite? What was her host inflammatory response at the site of the bite? When I go to Florida, I get about 20 mosquito bites. They turn bright red. They're about the size of a quarter. They stay for two weeks. Some people get, kind of get nothing. That makes a difference in terms of neuroinvasion in animal models with West Nile virus if you have a big uh, inflammatory response to the mosquito glands. There's also something bizarre about this family of viruses called antibody-dependent enhancement. Um, if you've been previously exposed to a related flavivirus like dengue virus, in vitro that will boost your viral response during a subsequent um, related flaviviral infection. So well-known cases of uh, dengue antibody-dependent enhancement to uh, fetuses that were exposed to those antibodies in utero and then later, later acquired a different type of dengue infection. We can see this happening in vitro with Zika. Whether or not this happens in vivo is a question that we are um, in very interested in. But when you're talking about a population in Brazil, 
where everyone is exposed to dengue when they're a child, and then they grow up and they become pregnant, become exposed to Zika, they may have had vi higher viral loads than people in other parts of the world. And what about host factors? Um, you know, uh, immunocompromise of the host. What's the placental susceptibility to viral infection? What about nutrient deficiency? What, what about the integrity of the blood-brain barrier in the fetus, in the child, in older adults? And what about viral strain, the Brazilian Zika viral strain, and how is that more or less virulent than the Ugandan strain? I'll just mention that it's much more virulent, but um, won't spend more time on that now. But then this is really what's keeping public health officials up at night. So sexual transmission of Zika had been reported in Polynesia in one case report, and uh, they thought initially that Zika, the Zika virus could be detected in semen for maybe a couple months. And so they kind of made a recommendation, well, maybe, you know, with a partner who has developed Zika, maybe you should wait two months. Then about uh, six or eight weeks ago, it came out that it's been detected now up to 181 days in semen, long after a neutralizing antibody response should have developed um, in this individual. And uh, sexual transmission has occurred even with an asymptomatic Zika viral infection in the partner. So now we don't know if this man or other men will ever clear the Zika virus. Will their partners ever not be susceptible to it? Uh, sexual transmission of Zika has been reported from male to female, male to male, female to male. Uh, CDC and World Health Organization says even female to female, we are totally uncomfortable with any kind of sexual combination that you can come up with in terms of sexual transmission of Zika. And when Zika came to Miami Beach, the CDC was sweating it like you, you can't even believe because the amount of exposed skin in that area makes this a totally unique problem. New York City as well, the sexual transmission piece of Zika uh, was uh, and is still a big worry. So now, finally, Centers, Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization are on the same page, and now they recommend men who have even traveled to an area with local Zika transmission to avoid conception for six months. That's men who travel to Florida for work. So uh, you can imagine how popular I am in the clinic uh, when I see my patients and their husbands, and I say, no go, you know. It's either abstinence, it's condom use, no pregnancy for six months, Take that work trip and enjoy, because it's going to be a little different when you come home. Go ahead. Can you say something about what the recommendations are for people who live in endemic areas? Which are what? Keep your, keep your skin covered. Use insect repellents, including DEET in pregnancy. A lot of women are leaving Miami and uh, for the duration of their pregnancies. That was big front page news in Miami. Um, let me keep going. Um, I'll just kind of do one little by bypass because uh, uh, when I saw this six weeks ago, I almost choked. It was uh, the title of um, something I got in my email about you know, a recent study. Zika thrives in the vagina. What a complete nightmare. How could you make this story even worse? So immunocompetent mice are a very poor model for Zika because they just don't get sick. What you have to do is you have to make the mouse susceptible to Zika by knocking out interferon or genetically modifying it. However, if you put Zika virus into the vagina, it stays for up to seven days in immunocompetent mice. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, and vaginal Zika virus infection in early pregnancy leads to fetal growth restriction and brain infection in mice. That's as close as you can get to a real pregnancy model. Um, with Zika, uh, which is much different than what we see in humans. So the mouse is very interesting, but again, there's a lot of differences with um, uh, human pregnancy. They found Zika virus RNA in human vaginal fluids for at least three days um, after infection, although it's a little bit hard to know exactly when the infection happened, and in cervical mucus up to 11 days after symptom onset. And I usually have a picture in every slide. I like to do that. And I thought, do I really need to have a picture of a vagina for this very you know, savvy uh, medical group? And I thought, well, but they're not gynecologists. Let me just ask my husband. So at first I said, you know, he's shaving in the, in the mirror in the morning. I said, you know, how close is the vagina to the baby's head and to the pregnancy? Total blank. The answer is it's only a couple centimeters. It's very, very, very close. I said, let me give him something easier. Walk me through what you know about vaginal anatomy. 
I'm not going to repeat what he said, but he totally failed once again. And so let me just say a couple of things. The vagina is a highway to the uterus. And so for people that study the microbiome, they know that what's in the vagina ends up in the uterus, whether that's lactobacilli. We can, we can find lactobacilli in the uterus and even in the abdomen. Um, if there are fastidious bacteria from bacterial vaginosis, we can find that in the uterus. Back to the 1960s, they put carbon particles in the vagina, and it ends up in the abdomen, probably through trafficking into um, the uterus and then out through the fallopian tubes. So that Zika thrives in the vagina is a huge problem for transmission to the pregnancy. So the Centers for Disease Control has activated a level one response for their emergency operations center, which it has only done four times before for Hurricane Katrina, H1N1, uh, influenza, which was very, very bad for pregnancy, Ebola, and now Zika. They call it the most complicated issue that the CDC has ever faced. Zika is a very challenging virus to fight, and the response is enormously complex. I mean, how do you win against the mosquito? I think the Global Health Department at the UW has been fighting for that for uh, a number of years, and we have not yet succeeded in that. When I, uh, we needed the help for the CDC for our study, and when we called them, there are people sleeping in their offices, which is intense, I think, even by American standards for work. So research areas of high priority uh, demonstrate cause and effect between Zika and fetal brain injury, which I think that our study was the final piece for this, understand how Zika is transmitted to the fetus, you know, what are the nervous system defects, the eye defects, what are the pregnancy outcomes in populations, what is happening in reproductive fluids, both in the vagina and the semen. We need a vaccine. We need it now. We need new diagnostics. We need new therapeutic strategies. A number of these things, I think we're uniquely poised in Seattle here to make an impact in the epidemic. And that's what I kind of realized in my gut when I started reading these uh, newspapers. I got on the phone and started calling people on my speed dial that have worked with me in this infection group in pregnancy. And I said, are you in? And I got, yes, I am in every single time I called someone. So it's a very committed team from the very beginning. So the study that I want to just tell you about that uh, uh, was our first study in Zika um, showed fetal brain lesions after Zika virus inoculation of a pregnant non-human primate uh, in late pregnancy when we inoculated um, at that point. And at this point, it was still not completely clear and not completely proven that Zika could cause fetal brain lesions. And only six weeks ago, I had people asking me, but does this really do it? Are you really sure? Isn't it those insecticides that they used? Isn't it Monsanto? Isn't it those Gates mosquitoes? No, 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 no. This is the virus. So why not just use mice? What's wrong with mice? We have lots of mice everywhere. Why do you have to use a non-human primate? Mice uh, are very different from humans, specifically in pregnancy. They have different sensitivities to certain pathogens. Their maternal fetal interface is quite different. The placenta is different. How they go into labor is different. Their reproductive tract gestation number, and even drug toxicity. If we're going to find prophylactic drugs, and we're going to find them tomorrow to use globally around the world, we need to know that this won't cause birth defects in humans and non-human primates. Many of you might remember the thalidomide um, drug that was used in the 60s and 70s, and it was used for nausea. It caused limb amputations, so people with uh, shortened limbs that you might see were probably um, exposed to thalidomide in utero. Thalidomide doesn't cause limb amputations in mice, but it sure does in non-human primates. So just another example in our historical, um, you know, in our history of medical research, why we need to be very careful about relying only on studies in the mouse. Our hypothesis was simple. Subcutaneous inoculation of Zika virus into a pregnant pigtail macaque will induce injury and arrest growth of the fetal brain. We used five subcutaneous inoculations of Zika virus. Uh, we did this uh, in late second trimester, early third trimester, because this was the pregnancy that we had at the time, and we were racing to understand what was going on. We used a strain of Zika that came from Cambodia, so not a strain that came from Brazil. This is a strain that had been present since 2010, which is uh, you know very close to what's circulating in Asia right now, which had been in Polynesia and Yap Island.
We did C-section necropsy as close as we could get to the due date without having a vaginal birth about 10 days before the due date. We did serial fetal ultrasound and MRI, took advantage of the expertise that we have here in Seattle to study this, and then did a number of um, basic science techniques, histopathology, flow cytometry, quantitative RT-PCR, and deep RNA sequencing to understand what had happened. So as an obstetrician, we love doing ultrasound and plotting fetal growth along the way. And something very strange started to emerge when we started plotting the growth of the fetal brain. Um, if you look in panel A, you can see uh, the mean um, plus two and minus two standard deviations. That's what those lines are. And the X's are where the biparietal diameter, which is really the distance kind of almost between your two ears is. And we measured this in the baby. It was a pretty big baby to start out with. It was actually, uh, by biparietal diameter, above two standard deviations above the mean. And it kind of maintained its trajectory for about three weeks, and then the brain stopped growing. Um, it essentially flatlined, and it lost three standard deviations over time. Contrast this to what the femur did. That's the bone in your thigh. And that merrily grew right along and pretty much stayed on trajectory the entire, uh, the entire case. And now I'll just show you some MRI images over time with the uh, image in the left-hand column being the first MRI that we saw. And then uh, the first number there, plus 10, is 10 days after inoculation. And 129 is uh, the days of gestation. And in the very right-hand column is the last MRI before C-section. And what we found right away on that very first um, MRI were these white lesions, which are T2-enhancing lesions, meaning too much water or edema in the brain. And in the monkey brain, this is around the ventricles, which is the site of injury for other viruses. Over time, this abnormality kind of increased on the left-hand side. And if you're looking at the MRI, right is left and left is right. So, uh, by the way that you're looking at it, on the right-hand side, that lesion expanded over time, got, got a little bit greater in volume. On the left-hand side, the lesion kind of disappeared, but you got volume collapse of the brain there. So a very recognizable and very quick um, pattern of injury to the brain. Next, uh, we asked our experts to uh, segment the brain, essentially identify on MRI what was gray matter, white matter, midbrain, cerebellum, pons, uh, CSF, uh, ventricle, and lesion, and, and calculate those volumes, which they can do. What we found is that the most striking change was that the white matter volume stopped growing uh, over the last three weeks, and the gray matter volume continued to increase. And we got persistence of large posterior ventricular cerebrospinal fluid spaces, and those normally contract in this species during this time point. When we looked at the histopathology, and the left-hand column uh, is normal. The right-hand column was from our Zika virus uh, fetus. I think it might be a little bit hard to see, so I'll just kind of describe um, what, what we saw was a marked deficiency of white matter, especially in the posterior brain around these lesions compared to the controls and then kind of a, a scarring phenotype, a lot of white matter gliosis. This is this cellular picture that you're seeing in F, um, an increased density of the type of astrocytes or um, cells in the brain that contribute to this, an increase in microglial cells, which are macrophages in the brain. We also saw axonal spheroids, which is this inset in panel F, very specific marker of axonal injury. All of these features of our histopathology were replicated and shown in uh, human Zika virus infected fetuses from a JAMA neurology paper just this last week. Then we looked very, uh, in a very sophisticated manner at what was happening to Zika virus RNA in the placenta, the fetal brain, and the liver. What we found on quantitative RT-PCR was that the highest levels of RNA were in the placenta, but also high levels in both the fetal brain and the dam brain, and also in the liver as well. And then we used RNA-seq to essentially find all of the viral reads of the entire Zika virus genome from this strain that we inoculated. 
we got complete coverage of viral reads, even in the untranslated regions, from not just the fetal brain, but from the maternal brain as well. So that this, to think that this virus is not getting into the brains of pregnant women um, is a mistake. It surely is. The question is, will the damage that's being done in these adult brains be any different because you're pregnant or not pregnant over time? We don't know. So to summarize, this was the first case of fetal brain injury in a non-human primate after maternal Zika virus infection. We saw arrested fetal brain growth, white matter injury, Zika virus RNA in multiple fetal organs. And we think that the pigtail macaque may have possibly unique utility for understanding Zika virus vertical transmission and testing novel therapeutics. And when we take what we learned from this macaque model and look at the literature, this might be one of those cases of late onset microcephaly where the brain sort of is, is not quite yet meeting these severe criteria at birth, but then just doesn't grow again because of this gliosis and extensive white matter injury. Big team that contributed to this, and this was kind of um, an immediate arranged marriage, so to speak, when we started doing this in January and February, about 70% of the team we had on board and, and people that I've worked with and established a long relationship. But racing like this, you add a lot of people to the team. You're working in a very high pressure uh, situation. You're deciding authorship and you know a number of things, grants, uh, money, um, in a very short period of time. And so there's kind of this element of, um, oh, I see you're watching football when you said you'd be cleaning the kitchen, you know, kind of from the female perspective. But um, it's worked out really, really well. I'd have to say we're a very, very strong team. We're moving forward with uh, new work right now. And uh, this team is uh, very used to now uh, working on deadlines. Um, so the Center for Innate Immunity and Immune Disease at the University of Washington, led by Mike Gale, was a big contributor to this, as well as the Washington National Primate Research Center. Seattle Children's had a big part to play here uh, in Lakshmi Rajagopal's lab, who is a very close collaborator of mine over the years with our Group B Streptococcus model. Uh, Bill Dobbins assisted as well, um, and the Diagnostic Imaging Science Center here, and a number of other collaborators, which I'm very appreciative of. We also got help from uh, Lara Brandau from Brazil to uh, show us um, human cases that looked like ours in the literature and that she helped contribute with, as well as uh, uh, our viral isolates came from UTMB and the Centers for Disease Control assisted us when we needed help to understand what we were seeing um, by electron microscopy that didn't match what was being published in the literature. Lots of grants supported this. Thank you very much. Take any questions. That was great. Thanks so much. I, I, one question. What do you think is the first therapeutic you'd like to test and, and why? Um, well, the, we've got a couple in mind. Uh, you know, vaccine development for dengue has been a little bit of a nightmare. It's 20 years in the, in the making. They now found a fifth serotype for dengue that wasn't covered by Dengvaxia. And as someone emailed me, this is kryptonite for Dengvaxia, when they find another serotype and you have this possibility of antibody-dependent enhancement. There's also concern about Guillain-Barre in adults with vaccination alone. Um, there's a number of things to figure out. Uh, when you've got a vaccine and you're going into countries that also have dengue, are you going to make dengue worse with this vaccine? So we're interested in neutralizing antibody. So neutralizing antibodies, certainly there are those out there. But do you have to administer that by IV at the time of a mosquito bite in order to prevent this? That's not really very uh, practical. There are prophylactic drugs that are being developed for a broad range of RNA viruses that boost one's own host immune response to fight the virus at the site of the mosquito bite. Those are quite interesting. There are uh, some drugs for hepatitis C that could be interesting, but um, all of these are pretty challenging. So we um, have some ideas in the works. And you know, every day, uh, I've got collaborators that have new ideas for grants that we should be putting in right now. And um, it's kind of beyond exhausting to sort of double your scientific program and have this pace that doesn't quit. But I've got, I've got some pretty type A collaborators. And uh, <laughs> we're working pretty hard. <laughs> but it works together. We've got, we've got some great, great team. So. <laughs>
So you presented some information about the persistence of the virus in different compartments. Is there concern that there could be persistence in women prior to pregnancy that could put the pregnancy at risk? We don't know. I mean, right now, um, just by uh, you know, current guidelines, women are in a little bit of different category than men. If they've had the virus two months later, they're good to go for uh, pregnancy, which worries me a little bit. But um, men seem to be the ones that are more at risk with uh, viral persistence in uh, possibly the testes. We're not sure exactly where it is. Somewhere immune privilege that is not having the same access to those neutralizing antibodies. Um, and persistence in semen. We just don't know whether they're ever going to clear it and what that means for their partners and future pregnancies. Once a woman has developed Zika, we think that she's probably going to be okay for a next pregnancy, but we don't know. Do you think it's like, the, like how you were saying, if somebody has dengue and they have Zika and they boost their viral load if they get infected, do you think that it's possible that the sec almost like the second case of dengue is worse? Correct, the same thing, that your Zika viral load may be in, and maybe it's something you only see in certain tissues, that the viral load is higher, or in the placenta, that viral load is higher. So it's not necessarily that they're clinically more ill, like you can sometimes see with uh, a second dengue infection, but maybe just that their response to it or their, you know, their fetal outcome might be worse. scary that immunity might not even really do it. In this class of viruses, immunity is a problem. So there's so many similarities to Sam being talked about this before. Um, is there a suspicion that for the non-symptomatic children that are being born, it might have maybe a little bit of like immunity? Um, that five years down the road, ten years down the road, you might start to see developmental or popular or other I think that's certainly possible um, because actually for some of the studies, and I didn't show all that data honestly, is that some of these children have had the brain MRI abnormalities with a normal head size. I may have just briefly glossed over it. but um, And we've actually had a few kids that were sent to us by our Brazilian collaborators who actually had a, looked very good actually at birth with a normal head size again, good normal tone, and actually had a, a, a presumed Zika infection based on laboratory evidence uh, during pregnancy. Uh, so presumably, these were really infected pregnancies. And so, and, but what the developmental outcome for these kids, I think, and whether or not there's persistence, persistence of the virus um, uh, in these babies, and whether or not that would affect development, I think remains to be seen. I'm not aware of, there haven't been any really systematic studies looking at that yet that I'm aware of. So it would be interesting. Sadly, the most severe tip of the iceberg, of, cor of course, is so severe. I mean, this is, cannot be mistaken at birth. And a lot of these kids are really profoundly affected. I think we're all really scared about the tail, you know, uh, you know that kind of you know merges into what might look like a very normal child at birth. And um, the CDC and NIH immediately started setting up these long-term uh, studies of outcomes of children over time to see who doesn't meet their milestones, what's their neurodevelopment like, um, you know, what, what's their cognitive studies like. And they were really sad. I think they've only got studies out to two years. They wanted to go out to five years, and it's just a money question of money. And I think what Congress hasn't really appreciated is that the mosquito is completely nonpartisan. The mosquito has never heard of Planned Parenthood. Okay? The mosquito doesn't care. And that's, that's the problem. And the focus really has been on Brazil. Are we starting to see the same trends throughout? It's not news anymore. And this is my husband says, have you seen it anywhere else? Oh, yeah. So Colombia was so proud of their, you know, outcomes, and it's like the, it's, the epidemic came much later. And so when I uh, gave a talk on this in Sweden, um, at, at a conference, a Colombian obstetrician came up to me and said, check this out, showed me his iPhone. <laughs> you, know, you know, 10 microcephalies in his hospital alone. I was, and, you know, that's in Honduras, it's in, you know, the Caribbean. It's, you know, it comes out in the MMWR. But, but it's not news. No one reports it anymore. I'm, it's there. It's a nightmare, so. I've heard from several collaborators just for the great point that they're trying to publish their series from other countries. And because, again, it's not news, they're having a hard time publishing those papers. So it's interesting. Now that the numbers have gotten to such a degree, I think um, there's a difficulty in publishing necessarily. Yeah. I have another question. <laughs> <laughs>
receptor for it because mm -hmm. of its affinity to neurons, mm -hmm. but also the fact that it's replicating in mucosal um, vaginal I cells, and also in, there's, I think, one or two case reports in breast milk as well. Is there a suspicion that also, like, CMB, like, it has a, it's using a receptor that's expressed on, like, a whole host, because I see it's in the spleen, it's in the liver, and these other places. Is it really just a promiscuous virus? for CMV actually that it has the same uh, any of the same like axial receptor affinity for example or anything like no that. I haven't seen that no um, I, I think CMV and Zika are probably quite quite different uh, you know CMV is a DNA virus this is an RNA virus uh, we're kind of dealing with a different animal uh, here especially with these different compartments the sexual transmission a number of things are and the carrier rate if I may interject the carrier rate right for CMV still, I mean, the asymptomatic care is so high that presumably if there was the same, if it had the same effect on brain development just from an epidemiologic standpoint, we would see a lot more. I mean, the rates of microcephaly due to CMV are not as, certainly as high, right? And, and yeah. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity to come here.